Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janice Oliva, president of ISE Magazine, and welcome to today's ISE webinar, Trends in Fiber Cabling, from Collapsible Ribbons to 200 Micron Fiber. How do new designs affect users? Presented in partnership with Light Brigade. Before we get started, please remember, if you've requested to receive a Bixi CEC, you will receive one credit for attending this live webinar. So please note the Big C CECs are not available for the recorded version, so you won't be able to share that link with people to get uh, a CEC, but those of you who are on live will be able to receive that. And keep in mind to try to, to focus in today on this content. We were just talking earlier about um, being um, able to multitask as very intelligent people, everybody on this uh, webinar, we are, but we need to really focus and just pay attention and shut down everything else and uh, focus in on this education. So I hope that you can take the time to do that today. And in this webinar, we're going to be discussing the new ultra high density cable design and how collapsible fiber ribbons and 200 UM fibers are making this possible. How will these changes impact planning, procurement, installation, troubleshooting, and restoration? How will they affect other hardware, such as closures, cabinetry, and splicing equipment? And how can you plan ahead to get the maximum benefit from these revolutionary new designs and deal with fiber counts in the thousands per cable? Learn the key factors to consider and how to avoid these future pitfalls today when you learn how new cable designs impact ordering requirements and planning, understand how these changes contribute to potential cost savings, consider the impact on slice processes and hardware, learn how these new options can impact your network design, and be prepared for the impact on splicing processes, fiber numbering, coloring, coding, and the tools and hardware needed to accommodate these new designs. So also, please, if you've not already subscribed, please subscribe to get your very own copy of ISE Magazine sent to your very own mailbox. You can click on the information tab or go to iscmag.com backslash subscribe today. And then, believe it or not, we are already working on ISE Expo 2019. Our team is in full force on that project, so please mark your calendar for next year's show. We're going to be in the great city of Fort Worth, Texas, September 24th through the 26th. I know it's going to be well attended, so we hope that we can see you there. And be sure to visit our ISE Buyer's Guide online. We've gathered and categorized all the latest products that you need for wireline and wireless jobs of today. Visit isebuyersguide.com to find out what you need to make your job easier and your network better. Now, some details about our sponsor and presenter. Today's webinar would not be possible without our sponsor, Life Brigade. Life Brigade has instructed more than 50,000 attendees in its public and custom classes since 1987. The company offers a variety of fiber optic courses that cover basic fiber optic design, maintenance, and testing, as well as more advanced topics such as fiber characterization and FTTX. They also provide course development services and will custom create a course to any fiber optic subject matter or skill level. In addition, Light Brigade produces professionally quality educational DVDs and online training. All of Light Brigade's training materials are technology-based and demonstrate theory and techniques applicable to any manufacturer's product. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to our esteemed presenter, Steve Walzak, Fiber Technology Manager of Light Brigade. Steve provides technical expertise for Light Brigade's fiber optic training course development. He's an Army veteran and West Point graduate. Steve has over 30 years of fiber experience working as a field engineer, product specialist, product manager, and solution specialist for manufacturers of fusion splicers, field test equipment, fiber amplifiers, and transceivers. He also has performed testing and troubleshooting on fiber to the home, 
fiber to the antenna, DWDM, CWDM, Raymond, HFC, and RFOG systems. Steve helped deploy, or excuse me, develop test and troubleshooting techniques and create job aids for testing these systems. He is a co-author of the JDSU, now the AVI, Guide to Fiber Optic Testing Volume 1. The last acronym's a lot of experience. Thank you so much for joining us. And in addition, we have two special guests that are going to be helping us with our Q&A session at the end. Mark Boxer, Application Engineering Manager at OFS, and Stephen Martin, Product Manager for Enterprise Cables with AFL. So as you can tell, we have a lot of really qualified people on here today to help educate us on these topics. So with that, I just have a real quick logistics slide to go through for your first time attendees. We've got, um, we do recommend actually that you view the bar, or excuse me, view the webinar in full screen mode for the best visual quality of our presenter slides. So you can do this by clicking on the two outward arrows at the top right of the slides there. And then the next um, part of this is the information tab at the top of your screen will allow you to find out more information about our speaker and our sponsor. And then the event resources tab on the left side will allow you to download a copy of the slides from today's presentation at any time. And we ask that you do submit questions throughout the presentation by using the ask a question tab. I'm going to hold these questions till the end for our Q&A session, at which time we will answer as many as possible. However, if we don't have time, we will go ahead and hold those questions and contact the provider of them personally afterwards. So with that, I'd like to hand off the webinar to our presenter, Steve Walzak. Thanks for joining us, Good. Steve. Good morning. Thank you. The importance of the presenter is inversely proportional to the length of their introduction. Um, my name is Steve Walzak. I'm technology manager at the Light Brigade in Seattle, which is a training division of American Fujikura. Today's webinar is an introduction, really, 50,000 foot view, an overview of UHD or ultra high density cables. And I'm going to be focusing on two technologies that makes these cables possible. Um, one is 200 micron coated fiber, and the other is what's known as collapsible ribbon or intermittently bonded ribbons. And there are other trade names for those items. Uh, Janice gave a beautiful overview of Light Brigade, and the only thing I'd add is um, most of our classroom, all of our practical classroom, is at least 50% hands-on, which um, we're a little bit proud of, and you know we're happy to do. We think it's important, and it's going to be important when you talk UHD cables. If you want to uh, mess about with these things, you want to get your hands on them and handle them. So hands-on is always important in your training on any new technology. So I'd like to manage the expectations for the webinar and tell you what it is and what it isn't. We're going to introduce a couple of these two technologies at a high level. We're going to look at how they impact every from procurement and planning to placement to the field to restoration. You have to think about all these things. And one of the beautiful things about the webinar is it will probably generate as many or more questions than it answers. But that's actually the goal of the webinar, is to do that. Because what we want to arm you with is the right questions for your contractors, clients, manufacturers, vendors, distributors, when you delve into this field of placing, using, splicing, operating, ordering, ultra high density cables, what are the right questions to ask? And what things should you know in order to go forward in this technology? So quick agenda. It's going to overlap a little uh, as we move forward. But we're going to talk first just about coding and 200 micron coding and the reduction in coding size. That'll be our start. Then 
we'll talk about collapsible ribbons and we're going to start to mention these are not mutually exclusive you don't have collapsible ribbons or 200 micron fiber you could have both you could have 250 micron collapsible ribbon you could have 200 micron collapsible ribbon so um, there are two different technologies that can be used together to even magnify the benefits we'll talk about as I mentioned planning and procurement placement splicing testing and troubleshooting So let's start out with 200 micron coated fiber. If you reduce a component in a cable, you reduce the weight and diameter of the cable, it seems straightforward. But you're going, gee whiz, you know, the coating isn't the heaviest part of the cable. You know, it's not a lot of it. We're only reducing it by 20%. And it, it seems like you are doing that. But you're reducing it in 20% by diameter, which means by area, you're really reducing it uh, by closer to 35% as far as the cross-sectional area of the fiber. And what happens there is that cascades because the cable's designed around the fiber and number of fibers you put in there. That's going to cascade to have benefits and weight reductions and, and material reductions throughout the entire design of the cable building outward. Now, you can use 200 micron coated fiber in existing cable designs, designs you're familiar with, that just simply now we've replaced the 250 micron with 200 micron. And the beautiful thing about there is that is going to be compatible with most or all of your existing hardware. Um, the strippers you have will still work. They are making some tighter strippers with smaller holes. They're called 175s for this. Um, but your your Miller tool, if you will, or Joan A tool or whomever you use is going to work fine. It's going to be interesting. Single fiber splicing will work fine because the glass is still 125 microns. Um, when we get to 200 micron ribbons, things get interesting, and, and we'll cover that in detail in just a bit. Okay. So here's a graphic. Um, thank you, Mark, for this. And it shows a primary and secondary coating. For us in the field, for me in the field, I've been in the field for years, I always thought of that as, you know, we when we had 250, 900, we knew there were two layers because sometimes you'd strip and strip one and not the other. But even the 250 micron coating, the acrylate coating on the fiber typically, is can be, is double layered, although we don't notice it, you know, in handling. It strips as one layer. And all we've done here is reduce the coating, but note that the fiber, the, the inner coating and the fiber diameter stay the same. So there, there's no changes there. Okay, and the coating, okay, we changed it, um, but it's still fully compliant with all of the requirements for the coating, which we're gonna go in in a little bit. And I, I, it's important to mention what the coating does as far as performance. To uh, release these cables with these 200 micron fibers, the manufacturers have to build, if, if they're going to make a 48 fiber loose tube with 200 micron fiber, they have to build one and test it, and even to destruction in some cases. But they have to bend it and flex it and temperature cycle it and hang it vertically and do a lot of things to it. And when they build a 864 count fiber with 200 micron coated fiber, they have to do all those things too. So it takes time to get all these things developed, you know, but this is mature, millions of kilometers deployed, higher and higher counts will probably become available as the industry progresses and, and newer designs. Just by sake of review, let's, let's talk about what the coating does. You know, we go, gee, 250 micron coating, we can get more fibers in if it was 200. Why didn't we do this years ago? Well. It took a long time to get 250 micron coating to work right. If, for those of us been around maybe as long as I have, you know that strippability was an issue for various designs and manufacturers of coatings. Um, 
coloring was an issue, the coloring not wiping off when you clean the cable, uh, reliability long-term after the coating sat in some of these gelled cables for years and years. So it's not trivial, and you have all these tasks that this coating is designed to perform. So really, you know, kudos to the engineers. They put a lot of work into this. And then you can't just have one or two manufacturers change and say, I'm going to go to 200 micron, I'm going to go to 175, I'm going to go to two and a quarter. Because we use these, we like to have our tooling consistent, you know, as far as our clamps on our splicers and things, and our stripping tools. And even the manufacturers, not all cablers make all their own fiber. And even if they make their own fiber, they often buy specialty fiber. Or a client may specify another manufacturer's fiber in a cable design. So having a, a standard of 250, you know, was very useful for the industry to grow and be as mature as it is. So 200 is a new standard. And, we, you know, the wonderful thing about standards is there's so many of them. But here we only have two. And largely, the 200 micron change will be transparent to everybody um, until there are some considerations when we get into ribbon pitch. And that's going to be, that's where we're going to generate some neat questions, I think. So I just want to review that. And I think the, um, the fiber handling and performance is also important here because these, these 200 micron fibers are going to feel a little different in your hand. And, is, you know, one manufacturer might be a little slippier, a little softer, you know, a little tackier or whatever. And you're going to have to feel these and get a feel for them and actually use them. So if all I do is reduce the size of the fiber coating, what's the benefit to me? What happens to my cable? And uh, this is a slide courtesy of Corning. And if we take a look at the cable on the left, that's a conventional 144 fiber cable. It's 12 fibers uh, per tube and 12 buffer tubes. And that comes out to an outer diameter of about 9.5 millimeters. Uh, a little less than a half inch, about that four somewhere in there, but a little less than a half inch in diameter. Now, it turns out that you can redesign that cable with 250 micron fiber, and you can put 24 fibers in each buffer tube. And just by doing that, you can save significantly. You go from 8.5 millimeters to about 7.5 millimeter diameter. So then we go the next step and say, now let's take this 24 fiber design and let's replace it with 200 micron fiber, 24 fibers per tube, and we go from 8.5 millimeters to about 7.5 millimeters in diameter. I'm sorry, 6.5. 8.5, 7.5, 6.5, roughly. So that's our savings in the three cables. And you notice when the cable goes down in diameter, there's less jacket. So it's not the coating weight reduction. It's all the other cable materials that get lighter in weight. And we'll look at where those impact because they impact really a lot of places. This is just an example of two collapsible ribbon offerings. I'm going to move a little bit to the other technology with collapsible ribbon. Now, there are other manufacturers. This is uh, OFS and AFL things I was able to get a graphic of for the webinar. I know that Sumitomo makes a, a collapsible ribbon. Prismian makes a collapsible ribbon. And if I left out a manufacturer, we're intending to be inclusive. I can't mention everybody, but I want to get, I'll give a couple examples and say these are different, but they're not the only ones out there. So go shop your manufacturer. I, I don't have a favored vendor here at all. And the point is, when you look at these two ribbon offerings, they're just slightly different when you fan them out. The staggering of the intermittent bonding is just a little bit different. And there's some neat designs are interesting that where you cross section the ribbon, in some cases it separates to two sixes, and then it separates to three fours, and then it separates to six two fiber ribbons. So that's quite interesting. Um, but each of these decisions and considerations and designs may affect the handling of the ribbon, particularly in the splicing arena. So this is just something to be aware of. I just want to say there are collapsible ribbons. Not all are created equal. They're, they're not the same. 
They retain all the benefits of flat ribbons, which is nice organization in groups and mass fusion splicing, but they have one huge advantage, which we'll see two slides from now, on their geometry that is really the magic of collapsible ribbons, in my opinion. So here's the separability. The, the real big thing here, uh, conventional flat ribbons are separable, but you generally need tools, or you have to be pretty dexterous and tricky. Collapsible ribbons or intermittently bonded ribbons tend to be very separable into whatever groups you need. And with fiber to the home, fiber to the curb, some 5G deployments, things like this, being able to do partial drops and separate a ribbon quickly to do a partial drop uh, out of a large count cable is a real, real advantage as far as splicing processes. So I did want to show that. So with collapsible ribbons, we can get a significant reduction in cable sizes. I'm going to show you that geometry in a second. It's flexible as far as counts and separating out counts and easy because you can do it with no tools. Your cable strands, your ribbons, your collapsible ribbons can be grouped by wrapping them with colored string or, or, or ribbon. Uh, we've seen organizer strings before in conventional uh, single fiber cables where bundles of single fibers were wrapped with something as an identifier. You could put them in loose tubes. You could put them in slotted cores or slotted core cables uh, available with ribbons in them. Uh, so there's other things you can do. I've seen things that aren't quite tubes that are wrapped that are a little bit interesting. I don't know if they're commercially available or not. I looked at some designs, but there's a very things you can do in here. And then I mentioned there's some new color coding. And there, there really isn't new color codes. The color codes stayed standards. But there's higher counts. Um, if you've only dealt up to 864 fibers and you're going to 1728 or 3456, there's another layer of grouping, uh, another color layer uh, in the code. And the key thing is going to be where your manufacturer uh, breaks down their subgrouping and their um, inner groupings to get the accounts that they achieve. And that could vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, which we'll show you. So here's where the geometry um, of the ribbon really helps you. And we can look on the upper left. We have a flat ribbon. For those of you that have uh, worked with existing flat ribbons, they bend very well in one plane. They, they bend very well along the flat plane. But if you try to bend them the other way, they don't want to bend. They're going to spring up and coil and twist because you can't bend them that way. And that's the beauty of these collapsible ribbons. You can roll them into little bundles. Now, when you roll them into these bundles, they're going to flex in the X plane and the Y plane. So this is very good as far as organizing cables in tight spaces and closures. Also, when you have a bunch of flat ribbons, what we did historically is we stack them. Okay, You put a stack of ribbons there shown in the right-hand graphic, the left-hand cable. And that makes sense, but you look and it doesn't look like very efficient use of real estate. It's not very efficient use of cross-section. We're essentially putting a square peg in a round hole so that there's a lot to be desired there. If we take those same ribbons that are shown there and collapse them, we can do some dramatic reductions in cable size. And in cable size, cable weight, etc. You can also, and that's just ribbon to collapsible ribbon. Remember, you can go from 250 to 200 at the same time, and then you get even magnified savings. So we're going to show you two cable designs real quick. They're not um, every design in the whole world. Uh, we couldn't do that. This is a, a string wrap or binder wrapped uh, subgroups. There's a, a little ribbon. It's colored so you can break out your subgroups. It's neat. You can get at it. Um, I think most of these cables are going to be dry core. Gel has gone away in a large way and a lot of people use powder or tape. 
Um, and you see some strengthening elements, and you also see some rip cords. You know, these are all just practical things. Um, if it's a central core cable and there's a central core that you have to uh, enter, you've got to be aware that you're, for a given cable count, your diameters will change. Some of the tools to enter central cores have fixed diameters. Um, some are adjustable. And, you know, some people do it with a razor blade, but, you know, it's just a little dangerous. But there are tools for this. So as you move into these, know what kind of cable you have, what kind of tools you're going to need to get into it. Uh, next design, classic, tried and true, popular loose tube design. Been around for years, great design. Uh, but what we see here is a very uh, small, relatively high count loose tube cable. And if we look back at the cable jacket here where the black leads to the Kevlar coming out of the inner duct, and then we look up here where the fibers are, there's not a lot of wasted space there. I mean, just the central member, and those fibers fully occupy those loose tubes. And we remember, you know, in single fiber cables and ribbon cables, ribbon and loose tube, how much space there was in there. So you're really getting a, a lot of efficiency of fiber packing density in these cables. And at the same time, you're getting the familiarity of something you've worked with for years and years, perhaps. Uh, there are slotted core designs. When we get to slotted cores, one of the things to uh, be aware of is they don't have colored binders. They have uh, the channels have rib markings that indicate what channel you're in. So that's a little bit different organization. And if you go to that cable design, it's just something you're going to have to learn and something you have to teach your techs. So just be aware of that. So again, this is a new color code chart, but it's a color code chart. And the key is when your vendor breaks down from, when do they go from six ribbons per binder or tube to 12 ribbons per binder or tube to 24 or 18, you know, wherever they're going to go? And how does it break for a given cable design? So the colors are going to be blue, orange, slate, uh, blue, orange, green, brown, slate, white. They're going to be that. Um, but the subgroup number and the number of ribbons can vary. So for 144, that's simply a single core with 12, 12 fiber ribbons. The ribbons are ring marked, which we'll show you in the bottom right. From 280, this example, 288 to 864 fiber, we just simply use six bundles of six ribbons, so 72 fibers in each group. And then we use four, six, eight, or 12 groups in this case. When we get above 864, we jump to 12 ribbons per subgroup, so 144 fiber subgroups. And then we have eight binders or tubes, 12 binders, 24 binders. If you have a different design that's loose tube or a slotted core design, the number of channel, the binder units would be the number of slots or the number of tubes. The colors would be the same, except in slotted core, it would be rib markings. And the ribbon band markings are going to stay the same. This is pretty standard. And uh, most people have used uh, stripe markings on ribbons up to, well, maybe you haven't, up to 12. And we simply do this in groups of five for easy identification. So, you know, you put tally marks. You know, take how many days you've been lost on a desert island, go to the palm tree, and you go slash, 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 slash. And then when you get to four, you put a hack through it, and you got one one wide band. So we go one, two, three, four, group of five. Then we add with the five band, one, two, three, four, to get six through nine. Two fives is a ten, et cetera. And just to, you would have figured that out, I'm pretty sure, but I thought I'd show it to you. So it does go up to 24, and it just goes up in exactly the logical way that you think it would. Uh, and if you want to see that, what it looks like on a ribbon, this is uh, 24 different ribbons. Uh, you could take a look at them. Oh, these are 12. This is just 1 through 12, but the markings extend 
I've used this, and I really like these bands. Um, in the flat ribbon arena, we've had um, you know the number written on the side of the ribbon, like dot matrix printed. And when that's all we had, you know, the difference between 13 and 18 was tricky. Difference between 15 and 16 was tricky if one dot didn't print particularly well. So um, I've worked with these bands recently up in northern Indiana, and they're really easy to identify. I've got senior eyes, so um, it, it's a nice marking method, real convenient. So now we're just going to talk mostly just a little bit about logistics and reels. So we've got a picture of a cable on a reel. Now back in the day, I would have looked at that reel and say, oh, that looks like about a oh, five-kilometer reel of 48-fiber cable, 24-fiber cable. And it is almost a five-kilometer reel. It's 4,500 meters, except it's 1,728-fiber cable which to put that number of fiber meters on a reel that size historically was unheard of. So that's just dramatic, at least in my experience. So if you look at how much more length you can get on a reel for a given drum and flange uh, construction and a similar cable count, when you move from conventional cables to ultra-high density cables, you get about a 35% uh, benefit across the board, which means if you're getting 35% more length on a reels, when you get to a project that might have used six or seven or eight reels, might use four or five. And if we look at a sweet spot, 432 is kind of a nice number where we get a lot of savings. If you looked at reels of 432 fiber cable that could be delivered in one truckload, what length of fiber could be delivered on those? For a conventional cable versus a UHD cable, we could ship 69% more length per truckload. So if a truck was carrying 1,000 fiber meters of this stuff, it could carry 1,700 fiber meters. That means less trucks, smaller trucks, you know, it's just a benefit in the savings and shipping cost. Also, we know that on any given reel, there's a little waste on the inside and outside. We always cut the outer tail off because it's been exposed and, you know, we're not, you know, cut a couple of meters there. And the inner flange where it goes through and has an inner test tail, um, you've got some waste there on the inside. And if you estimate that, you could pick your number, 25, 50, 100 meters per reel. When you have that waste, if you have fewer reels, you have less waste. And this could be, you know, maybe just a savings of 1% or 2%. But it is significant. And where I think that's going to be interesting is the, distri the distributors and the cutting houses for these cables. When they order these long, long, long reels that are compact, when you order a number of individual custom cut sizes, they're going to be able to service that off one big single reel instead of having, oh, now we got a short, we can't we can make the first cut, but we don't have enough left on the reel to make the second, so we got to start a new reel. And that led to a lot of shorts and a lot of waste of cable at distributors. So that could definitely be a benefit. So that is for the planners and procurers. Now we'll look at outside plant and construction and we'll look at placement and we will look at splicing and other things, but just primarily those. So let's talk about placing a cable in a duct, which is a very common uh, application. It could be in plastic inner duct. It could be in duct block that's existing in a, in a metro area. Uh, it could be in uh, inner duct that was bored in, directionally bored or trenched in uh, in a suburban application. But the point being, these cables are very small. You can either use smaller ducts or you can use subducts. So now you can start thinking about segmenting 
your duct and a job that might have required one cable in each duct, you may be able to segment the duct, put two cables in it, and save an entire cost of one duct over the length right of way. And, you know, those, that, those aren't cheap. So now you've got more cables in the duct. You've got a lower fill length of cable in the duct. So that's going to be less friction when you pull the cable in. And if you're familiar with pulling cables in duct, you hit the first turn, you load up some friction. When you hit the second turn and pull, the added friction from the second turn is a multiplier on the, how much back friction was there from the first turn. And when you hit the third turn, the multiplier there is times the second turn. So when you have multiple bends in a duct, your pulling friction goes up exponentially. And your pulling friction is partially dependent on percent of duct fill. So if you're a really small cable in that duct, you're going to have low friction. You'll be able to do longer pulls. Um, that may mean fewer intermediate pulls, which means fewer, uh, less labor, uh, less traffic stoppages. It could mean you could put your intermediate poles when you want them or you want them instead of in the middle of a busy street. And more efficient use of your duct space overall. Also, these are long lengths on reels now, so you're probably still going to have to figure eight at some point. Maybe you do, doing a center pole or figure eighting the tail of the cable. But because this is lighter and smaller, you can figure eight it a heck of a lot more easily than you could with a heavier, stiffer cable or a heavier, larger diameter cable. If you're doing aerial plant, your EHS, your extra high strength strand diameters could go down. When you look at your NESC ice and wind loading charts, uh, the cable diameter is generally what lashed a strand, presents a cross section, and they've calculated what the wind and ice loading is on that. If your cable diameter goes down and your cable weight goes down, uh, you can use lighter EHS strand. So this is another benefit. So obviously, if you can pull longer lengths, you have fewer splice points. It's rather obvious. Smaller cable diameters and smaller fiber diameters can mean smaller closures. And we're going to see one other driver for smaller closures, which is the flexibility of the um, collapsible ribbons. That's going to make a big difference. So when we splice a cable, we have to do a couple things to it. We have to separate it from its subgroup. This is taking the binders off, or it is opening a buffer tube or slitting a buffer tube if we're mid-span. After we do that, we spread out our 6 or 12 or 24 fibers, uh, I'm sorry, ribbons. After we spread out our ribbons and find the one we want, we separate those, and we separate down to a single fiber. And it may be difficult to see on the monitor you're on, but there's maybe 11 fibers below the, these two fingers, and there's one fiber you can see at the top here going above those, across those. And that may just be the single fiber that I want to drop to that house, to that ONT, to that ONU, or to that 5G antenna. So that's your breakdown of these fibers. Again, because it happens without tools, uh, it is a little faster, it is a little simpler, more efficient. What's even more interesting to me is, again, I mentioned that you can bend ribbons in a flat plane, but only in the X, not in the Y. At collapsible ribbons, you can bend in the X and the Y plane. So some cool things happen here. And let's look at how we broke these down. Over on the left is our organization where we're identifying the ribbon and the fiber that we want to splice. So we take, let's say this is an 864 fiber cable, whatever it is, and we have 
12 binder groups or 12, this could be buffer tubes, but we have 12 groups of fiber here. And there are six fiber, six ribbons each with 12 fibers in them. So we take all of our subgroups here and we find the one we want, the slate one or the green one. And we take that one group here. So the second loop up and to the left, the second loop is a bundle of maybe six ribbons. This group below could be seven bundles of six ribbons each. Then we take the eighth bundle and we coil it up here. Now we separate that out and find the one ribbon inside there that we want to work with, coil that here, and then we separate out the fiber of interest. And it's hard to see on this. You could just see it maybe uh, on the lower left. There's another, there's four loops there. There's a loop in the upper left that's almost impossible to see, single fiber. But this is how we can organize our closure. And you would take the second bundle, do a twist on it. You actually take third bundle, do a twist on it, fold it on the second bundle, take the second bundle, do a twist on it, fold it on the big bundle, and put that in your tray. And when you do that, your tray looks something like what you see on the right. So 576 fibers in a closure, if we look at the cable diameter here, that's probably about a half an inch. So that is a small closure. And being able to coil 576 fibers and express them through there is really, really nice. You don't have to use these giant, well, they're not, about 450Ds, and you, know, you may go to a C or a B, at smaller type closure. And I think where this is going to be important, we're doing a lot of partial drops and mid-span drops. And what's driving the size of our closures is the cable count. If you have a very high cable count, you have an 864, you need this large a closure to express all those, all that 864 fiber cable through there because the ribbon won't coil any tighter. It's just going to spring out, doesn't have the room. If you have these nice, flexible, collapsible ribbons, now you can size your closure, not for how much fiber you want to express, but for how many splices you actually want to do, which might be just two or four fibers. So you can size your closure, say it's a one tray closure. It's the one through 24 fiber closure, not the up to 288 splice closure. It's the 24 fiber splice closure, but I can still express all my collapsible ribbons inside it. So that's a pretty cool feature. So when we get to splicing operations, your considerations are, Am I doing single fiber or ribbon splicing? And what coating size is involved? So if you're moving from 250 micron to 200 micron single fiber splicing, you probably won't have any issues at all as far as splicing. Your existing clamps will likely work. Your cleaver should work. And the fiber is still 125 micron, so your V-grooves should work. So there's not a lot of issues here. You have to test it and try it and make sure. Maybe you want a little bit smaller diameter stripper, but you should be okay. If you're moving from 250 micron conventional ribbon to 250 micron collapsible ribbon, you're probably going to be okay as well. Okay. When you get to this change, the biggest change I see moving from flat conventional to collapsible ribbon is sometimes the thermal stripper settings, the temperature setting on the stripper or the guides in the stripper or the, the way the stripper set up. And in some cases, your stripper, you may just have to adjust the temperature. In some cases, you might have to send it to the factory to be upgraded. In some cases, you may have to buy a new one if it's a very old thermal stripper and can't be upgraded, but this is what we run into. If you're moving from 250 micron ribbon to 200 micron collapsible ribbon, then your issues can be potentially significant. And that's because the pitch size of the ribbon has changed and the fibers are closer together. Now, in some cases with 
some designs of some collapsible ribbons, there are clamps that can transition that 200 micron pitch and fan it out to a 250 micron pitch to be spliced in your existing splicer. It will sit in the V-grooves of the splicer, the 125 micron V-grooves, but with 250 pitch spacing. So we just fans that out just a little bit. That's a special clamp that works with some collapsible fibers. In some cases, that may not be possible. And we won't be able to transition, and we'll have to go to something like a 12-fiber splicer with 200 micron pitch V-groups. Okay, and that's, that's where I think it gets quite interesting. So as promised, I always try to meet my expectations. As promised, I said we would generate more questions than we would answer. And here's a start. Okay. The first one's a statement. So all collapsible ribbons are not exactly alike. And where the intermittent bonds are might matter as far as being able to transition a fiber to 250 splicer or if you need a 200 micron pitch splicer. So not, you got the word encapsulated, that just means flat or conventional ribbon. Not every 12 fiber splicer will be able to splice every combination of every design of 250 micron to 200. So the question is, collapsible to collapsible, collapsible to flat, mostly stripping changes. But 250 to 200, 200 to 200, you either have to be able to transition to your V-groove design or you're going to need a different V-groove pitch. And that could be interesting. Will your current clamp works? Will they work? The two were answered every fiber question. It depends. Um, do I need different clamps? Can I buy clamps for the splicer I have that do a transition to my pitch? Or do I have to buy a new splicer? Uh, is my splicer upgradable or do I have to buy a new splicer? Uh, if I buy a 200 to micron to 200 micron splicer, is it backward compatible? Or are they dedicated? The V groove is going to be replaceable. Historically, the V-grooves are very precision uh, installation with relation to the electrodes. They weren't user replaceable. But what's going to happen in the future, I'm not sure. Okay, but tooling is being developed now. It's a real interesting industry question, and lots and lots of energy in the industry is being devoted to this. So the answer to all the above questions may be manufacturer-specific with respect to the splicer and manufacturer-specific with respect to the ribbon and or ribbons if they're dissimilar on either side. So these are the questions you're going to have to put in your pocket and ask and make sure you've covered it. Now, once you find out that you can, cannot do this, whatever it is, don't just answer the question, can I do it? Um, answer the question, can I do it? Am I going to be doing a lot of this and can I do it productively? because that's possibly as interesting a question. So I thought I'd mention that. Moving on, um, I think the last slide is restoration. Okay, testing and troubleshooting. So we'll go back here. When we get to testing and troubleshooting, really things don't change that much. And it's business as usual. It's just a lot of business. So if you sat down, to test you know, or commission a, a cable plant, and it's got 864 fibers, and you're testing them singly. That's quite the endeavor. If it's got 1,728 or 3,456 fibers, and you have to commission it, that's a serious endeavor. So now I can see us doing this in conventional ways, but I can also see this being done as um, maybe some productivity tools are going to come in and help. So if we look at this... Uh, if you've ever tested a high count patch panel with an LC jumper, after about 500 matings, my LC jumpers look like my RJ45 cables in my office and that none of them have tabs on them anymore. So that, that little tab is not indestructible. And depending on your craft sensitivity or if you squeeze it when you don't snap it in and yank it out, is how long it's going to last and who made it and how they made it. 
So um, you might need three or four LC access cables to get through a 1728 patch panel, or maybe there'll be a special testing LC connector made that's a little more robust. When you're testing unterminated cables, and we've had to do this in the past, we often used uh, the fusion splicer as a test jig. We, you could temporarily splice on a pigtail with individual, a fan out that had individual connectors on it to test 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, then break it, splice on the pigtail to the next fiber and do 12 uh, tests. More commonly, you wouldn't burn the fibers. You wouldn't splice them. You'd simply use the V-grooves in the splicer as a test jig and shoot across the air gap, OTDR, test your fibers to a power meter, OTDR, whatever you're doing. And that worked out just fine. And when you're doing 144 fiber cable, that's 12 setups and 12 tests. Takes a little while, and then you're done. But do you want to tie up your fusion splicer all day doing that testing when you're doing 1,728 fibers? So now... These have existed. We've had 12 fiber to 12 fiber V groove alignment, bare fiber adapters, but we typically, well, I'll use my splicer. But you only did it for a short time. If you're going to be there all day, maybe you want to invest in some of these tools. So you got to think about the productivity when you're testing. As far as troubleshooting and restoration, you certainly have a large number of eggs in one basket when you have a 1,728 fiber cable. So you're going to have to plan for redundancy if this cable gets cut, and restoration, of course. But when you plan for redundancy, the one thing I see people, we know it, we plan for but we miss it sometimes. There's logically redundant and physically redundant. When you have, oh, this 1,728 fiber cable A, if it gets cut, is going to switch over to 1,728 fiber cable B that goes over there. And you go, oh, terrific. Except what nobody noticed is as we exit the data center, cable A and B go through exactly the same handhold. So if that handhold gets dug up, your redundancy goes away. And that's where you have logical redundancy, but you don't have physical diversity of route for physical redundancy. So it's something, again, to plan for. What if you have to restore a 1,728 fiber cable? Do you have a uh, two 864s? Or do you have a 1,728 patch cable or two 864s? Do you have two 864s? Do you have them installed both in a single closure or are they in two different emergency restoration kits? Are you going to split that 1,728 out somehow? That would be tricky. So you've got to think about these in advance, uh, think about practicing, think about training, think about planning, think about building your own ERK kit or, or and taking a class on how to build one or, or how to respond. So a lot of considerations there. But they're, they're the same ones. It just gets magnified just a little bit when we go to these counts. So to sum up, I, I really think, you know, it's a glass half empty or it's a glass half full. On, on these new designs, and I think the glass is 95% full. I think it's just benefits, benefits, benefits all across the board. Enables all kinds of new um, exciting architectures. And you know, data centers are driving this. 5G deployments are definitely going to drive this. And it's cool because the fiber cable market's been mature. You know, we've had 250 micron fiber for 30 plus years, and now we've got a, a brand new thing. We've had ribbons for years. Now we got a brand new thing. Is it going to impact some other tools and processes? Sure it is. But I think that's a small price to pay, and I think the industry will solve it. I know they're working to solve it, and there's, there's many solutions available already. So I think that's a good thing. Again, generating more questions. Do you need you know, a smaller gauge of EHS in your warehouse now? You're putting up these smaller cables. Do you need segment and interduct? Do you need to order some D-closures instead of D-closures because you don't need the D-closures anymore? Is that going to happen? I think in the placement field, I think we're going to place the cable the way we always have, and then the construction managers and the pulling crews are going to fight, you know what? 
we can go, we could skip three more manholes before we need an intermediate pull. I think that's going to be an incremental learning process is what we can do there. So that's important. And then your OSP managers, your splicing contractors, your splicers, I think you need to get samples of these, and I think you need to um, try them out and say, do they work, and are they productive? So the last thing I'd like to do is thank some important people. Uh, this presentation was uh, conceived with a, a lot of contribution from Patrick Dobbins, American Fujikura, uh, Mark Boxer, who is on the phone with us for questions, Tom Stafford, also of OFS. Um, and I wanted pa Patrick was going to be on the phone. We got a last-minute replacement, Stephen Martin from American Fujikura, who's, and Stephen and Mark are standing by for questions because I wanted to have the experts on here. Uh, I'm just simply the presenter. So um, that said, I'm going to turn back over to Janice and see what well, we have. Steve, thanks so much. Um, a lot of really good information. And now we're going to open it up for Q&A. Um, so if you would go ahead and enter those on the Ask a Question tab, we'd appreciate it. Um, like uh, Steve said, you know, some of these things actually open up um, the forum for more questions. So this is the time to get those answered. And like he said, we do have two guests that are here with us on the line. We have, again, Mark Boxer, Application Engineering Manager at OFS, and Stephen Martin, uh, Product Manager for Enterprise Cables with AFL. So send us your questions, and um, we'll go ahead and take care of those now. First one here I've actually got is um, – uh, oh, actually, somebody just sent in an a excellent overview, exciting opportunities to leverage. And, and yeah, I agree with that, um, definitely. Um, a great job covering everything, and it's, it's exciting to see where we can go with the industry with this. So thank you for that. But the question is, uh, are these cables available today? And, and yes, I'm assuming they are, but I'd love to hear the um, people who are involved here. We did see some samples, but can you tell us um, more about that? Um, maybe Stephen or Mark, you want to respond about the availability today because I know actually there's so much fiber that's being laid out there right now. The demand is very high, so um, your comments would be appreciated on that availability. So, Stephen, do you want to take that or do you want me to take that? So, so in you know, in general, I'd say that. Um, you know, products absolutely are available, uh, and um, what's going to be interesting to me, and this is this is Mark from OFS, um, you, know, you know, certainly products are have been available, uh, you know, will be available, and one of the things about you know, especially you know, both 200 micron and rollable ribbon is they're they're very interesting tools uh, for the toolbox, and so what I think we're going to see is just additional designs in different types of cables that use these fundamental technologies. Um, you know, in a lot of different types of applications. So not only are they available today, uh, but I think we're going to continue to see these technologies um, you know, proliferate, proliferate in the field in different applications and with you know all different types of cable designs. Thank you, Mark. Stephen, do you have anything to add to that? He might be on mute and not realize it, but I'm sorry. There I am. Okay. There you go. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I, I agree. This is Steve Martin from AFL. Uh, we, we see the same thing from our perspective. The uh, the collapsible ribbon technology uh, is uh, evolving. Uh, there's more capacity associated with the development of these next generation, higher density ribbon products in the market today, we think that's only going to grow. Uh, yes, uh, and as Steve was saying, you know, 200 micron ribbons are certainly a reality today. Uh, manufacturers are today making these next generation high density ribbon products with 200 micron fiber. Uh, the application of 200 micron in loose tube has also been happening for several years now. Micro cables uh, are available today in the market, which uh, 
Steve had shown in his presentation early on that show uh, the ever decreasing size, increasing fiber density of loose tube cables. <clears throat> uh, all the, the major cable manufacturers today make uh, loose tube cables that are known generically as micro cables with ultra high density packaging uh, uh, approaches where 200 micron is enabling uh, what used to be a pretty heavy, thick, a uh, loose tube cable package to be reduced by, in some cases, over 60%, which provides the plant owner, the plant system designer, new ways to save significant money in their plant infrastructure design and build. Uh, if Great I may, question. can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Sam. Uh, no, just actually, just to tell you what a hot topic this is, I just got an email from a colleague. There's another webinar on extreme density networks in eight days on the same subject. So we may have just be the pioneers here. We've broken the floodgates. I think you're going to see a lot of more information coming out as it becomes more commercially available. And I would especially, if you want to learn more, I'd especially direct people to the, uh, the manufacturer and vendor community, the standards community. But the IWCS, the International Wire and Cable Symposium, I think there's going to be a lot of papers on stuff like this. So for the people in your company that manage this kind of thing, they may want to keep their ear to the ground or learn more there. Um, but it, it's really, interest is really increasing. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with that, you know, your comments, Mark, about um, the weight, this actually comes up, so it's, it's connected a bit. How will real weight, you know, the real, change with increased cable length? So I don't know who wants to take that on first. Um, yeah, that's yeah. You know, I'll, I'll take a pop and then toss okay. over to Steve. And and it's you know really um, that's going to be scenario specific. But um, you know certainly these you know, these cables for with both 200 micron fibers as well as collapsible ribbons. Um, you know they they are lighter, uh, which means that overall, if you're using the same reel, then you can get much more reel on the cable, uh, and so, you know, you just have to balance the, the weight of the cable, um, uh, you know, with the, the same reel. So, um, yeah, I think that that's one of those that would need to be, we need to address that kind of, uh, you know, situation by situation. Great. Mark, any thoughts? If, I'm sorry, Steve, if you don't want to see yeah. Walls, if I may, from an outside plant perspective, a lot of times the limiter on your project or your reel is your line handling equipment. It's the flange diameter on your line truck, how high your arbor is, or the weight that your truck can handle. So actually the beauty of this cable for a given set of line equipment that you have a lot invested in, that same line truck, instead of carrying a 5K reel, can now carry a 7K reel you know, on the same arbor. So that's, I think that's really how it's going to shake out. You know, there's only so much weight you can get on a reel and so much weight the truck can hold. I mean, it, it, I remember going 12 kilometers. My gosh, we had like a nine foot flange or, you know, a 10 foot flange in the old days. Now they're going to get, you know, if it's a medium count, they get nine kilometers and, you know, something a local contractor can handle. So I think that's it's going to take the weight way down. When you you got to go fiber count per fiber count equivalent, it's going to be lighter, and you're going to get more on a reel or make the reel smaller if that suits your purposes. That I just want to add that that's usually calculated in the opposite direction. Yeah, and to to give an example, a typical number can be in the thirty percent weight reduction range. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, good points, and thanks for mentioning that. Um, just real quick, I want to say to everybody, I know you committed to an hour here, so if you have to go and get to your next task, please do so. This was, it will be on the recording. It will be accessible on the website later, so you will hear the continuation of these Q&As. We have a, a handful of them. I do want to continue on since we've got these gentlemen um, captive right now to respond to them, so we're going to keep going but you can access this at um, post event in the recording. So another question here is about, uh, it's asking about when 
slicing a 250 12 count ribbon to a 212 count ribbon, when placing the heat shrink over the slice, will it create any loss due to the ribbon folding in the heat shrink? So let's start this time um, with Mark. Yeah, so again, there, if you look at the uh, you know, if you look at the ecosystem that it takes in order to make a slice, you have a fiber, and the fiber is manufactured, you know, or the fiber and the ribbons are manufactured by by certain people and they're placed in cables. You also have the sleeve, and then you also have the splicer. And one of the things that we found is that there can be differences, you know, in those various um, in those various scenarios. So I can I can tell you if it's done well, then yeah, there won't be any loss. Um, but I, you know, I can't say that for every combination of those three components that go together. So back to you know, Stephen or Steve's one of the Steve's slides. Um, you know, just make sure that you're you do you ask some questions and and do a little bit of testing before you you plan to deploy. But you know, if it is done well, then yeah, that that can be done with no significant loss. Okay, great. Um, Stephen from AFL. Yeah, uh, uh, I agree with what Mark is saying. The, uh, the splicing of, of, of these collapsible ribbons, whether it's 250 to 250, 200 to 200, or 250 to 200, uh, there's different uh, setups uh, required. Uh, and each setup is uh, fiber, splicer, manufacturer specific. And there's each one of the manufacturers of uh, Splicers for fusion splicing have their own set of procedures for the proper components to use when you're splicing these different types of ribbons together. So the probably the, the safest thing to do is to uh, reach out to uh, your fiber splicer manufacturer and ask them for guidance on the proper uh, procedures and par proper parts and pieces to use for the splicing. Okay, great. Steve, do you have anything to add to those comments? No, not on that one. I, it, the thing is that that heat shrink usually has a flat plane, so the folding, you, you're talking a transition from 200 to 250, which is not a huge bend radius, you know, even over that short distance. So I'm sure it's a soluble problem and the splice manufacturers have addressed it, but it may be, you may not be able to use the heat shrink you've been using for the last 10 years, you got to, you know, buy the one appropriate to that application. Okay, thank you. Um, this is interesting. This is from a supplier uh, company who has spoken to actually a supplier of a uh, rollable ribbon cable. And they're saying that recently uh, they were told that mid-span is not recommended on their bundles because the coating will tear away from the other fibers they're separating. So they only recommend full mass fusion slices. How, and he's asking, how do other suppliers mitigate this in their bonding technique? So maybe, um, Stephen, if you want to start with this, um, yeah, your response. That's right. No, that's a, that's a great question, uh, and uh, as Steve had mentioned in his uh, presentation, each manufacturer of collapsible ribbon has their own uh, unique methodology for forming this collapsible ribbon. Uh, bonding points, separation between bonding points, the number of fibers that are bonded, uh, the bonding method. Uh, and what that results in is, yes, there is a difference between one manufacturer and the other, how easily these individual fibers are separated from each other within that 12-fiber collapsible ribbon. And I'm, I'm talking about this. I think that's what the, the reason of the question was. So mm -hmm. if you want to access less than that 12-fiber set and drop off, uh, you know, say you're doing a ladder and you want to access uh, some number of fibers less than the full complement of 12 in that ribbon, Again, there are handling procedures that are well-defined by each one of the cable manufacturers uh, that, that make these collapsible ribbon products <clears throat> that lay out guidelines on how to proper, properly handle uh, single-fiber splicing. 
and I think that's really the easiest way to define it is you're looking to be able to do something less than a 12 fiber mass fusion splice. You're going to want to express through the balance of those fibers as well as the balance of all the other fibers in that cable uh, during the access of uh, those uh, few fibers. Is there a risk that those, the, 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 the fiber ribbon will be compromised as it's being uh, expressed uh, within the closure slack environment. It's, it's possible, but there are certain procedures, again, that are very well developed and very well defined on how to reduce the risk of your uh, collapsible ribbing losing its bonding. Uh, I, I'm hoping I'm answering the question if I understood it correctly. Um, uh, so, yeah, yeah. there are. There are handling procedures that are available to, to reduce the risk of that happening. Yes. I think you have. Mark, do you have anything to add to that, though? Yeah, I mean, just, just making – there are different ways of making the ribbons, and I think Steve, Steve, Stephen um, you know, kind of indicated that in his response, but there are different ways of making the ribbons. And what I would say is, um, uh, you know, the, you probably need to look – Manufacturer by manufacturer um, at you know, at um, you know, ways of mitigating that issue, um, but uh, you, there in if you make it, I think in one way, then you're probably a lot less likely to encounter that issue than than with others. And I'm I'm not going to go into a lot more depth besides that. Okay, great. Uh, Thank you. For if, that. I could, Steve. if I could, if I could paraphrase yeah. the question, I think so. Okay. I, I think what the practical, you know, uh, question at the end user point is, um, with these collapsible ribbon designs, I guess with at least some manufacturers, they're not exclusively for 12 fiber. It's what you can, it is possible to do a partial ribbon splice, a four fiber or a six fiber splice to a drop with collapsible ribbons. That's the future that we envision that's, if you follow the proper procedures, and I did get briefed on this at hyperscale, there are they've been using this for a long time. There are techniques to doing it, but could you both just? We're not excluding the possibility of six fiber and four fiber drops when we go to collapsible ribbon. I don't believe that's some of this is point to point for data centers, but I don't believe that's the intent or future of this product. Is it, in your opinion? Uh, no, uh, this is Steve Mark from AFL. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the largest volume of these collapsible ribbon cables is not data center applications. It's uh, access providers, service providers. So, okay. Uh, and, and certainly there's a lot of uh, uh, fiber to the home projects where these technologies are being used today. Uh, the, the collapsible ribbon cables uh, where you have uh, – Drop applications where you're accessing less than 12 fibers for that drop point. So uh, these cables can be used like a ribbon. They can be used like a loose tube cable. Uh, and the procedures on how you access and use these cables have been well developed and are still proven for, for quite a few years. You know, this cable technology is an interesting point. Uh, I'm sure Mark could uh, test it as well. Uh, collapsible ribbon technology is not new. Uh, it's relatively new to uh, the U.S., uh, but collapsible ribbon technology that we're talking about today has been in use in high volume commercial applications uh, in Japan for, you know, say, for, for many years before we first saw it here in the U.S. So it's not new new technology, but it, but it's certainly new to the U.S. So it's for the audience's purposes. I just wanted to make that clarification that they understand that this is not something new uh, with respect to un, uh, untested, untried technology. It is well developed and a very robust technology, which is why it has become so popular uh, to the point we believe it's going to completely replace the encapsulated older ribbon technology uh, in the not too distant future. Good point. Thanks for uh, bringing that up because some people may not have realized that. Um, another question is, does the thinner nature of 200 micron cause any durability or installation concerns, bend radius, things like that? Um, Mark, so, want to start? Yeah so, yeah, so with, you know, I just want to address the last one you know, just a tiny bit more. I mean, we... Uh, as a manufacturer, and we kind of consider, um, you know, that you have to 
it's kind of table stakes to be able to do mid-span. So, um, you know, echoing what Stephen says, you know, we think that these are this technology is very important um, for you know really for all applications down the road, and so you know consider that yeah, mid-span is going to be very important for that. So, you know, just to answer the other question as far as the um, you know the reliability of the 200 micron um, and durability or installation concerns. Um, you know, the one thing I can point to is is back to um, you know, back to Steve's slide uh, that you know, there have been millions of kilometers that have been used. You know, uh, 200 micron fibers came out at the earlier the earlier part of this decade, and they have been used in you know, very very large volumes uh, in Europe, and actually have been used in reasonably large volumes in the U.S. You know, over the last the last several years, and um, they have proven themselves to be reliable to this point, and there's no reason for us to believe that anything will change moving forward. I put the um, coding function slide up there. Uh, you know, it still meets all those requirements, and I know the stripability is even a little easier, but you don't want stripability to be too low. So, you know, toughness is one thing, and then stripability is another thing. There's these engineering trade-offs, and if they go to a smaller diameter coding, then they change the Young's modulus of the of the acrylate, they changed the polymer composition a little bit. They've been doing this for years, and we struggled with this in the early days of fiber cabling, I, I could tell you. So um, they've got this, I mean, they've got it sorted to meet industry standards, what's ever in the TR or GR. There is a spec on each of these and what the coating must perform, and each manufacturer has tested and met that, or they really can't, you know, reliably introduce this product to the market. So. Thanks. Steven? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's my, my two cents on this is that, uh, you know, it's bending sensitive technology, which has really enabled the redu reduction of the size of the, the buffer coating over the core cladding structure. Uh, as Mark was saying, this has been uh, commercially used uh, for approaching 10 years now uh, in the U.S. and for a longer period of time in, in Europe. The reality is, is that today it's, it's relatively new. It's gaining traction. It's providing the opportunity to make much, many, many package designs, whether it's ribbon or micro cable, uh, smaller, which has a whole bunch of different value propositions associated with them. Uh, it's very likely that uh, 200 micron will replace 250 micron. So it's, uh, I think it's just a matter of optical fiber manufacturers being able to transition their production equipment to support that demand. Uh, how long that takes is unknown, uh, but uh, I think what's going to ultimately drive that is, is the demand for these smaller, higher density products. And of course, you can, you can get much smaller cables with 200 micron fiber than you can with 250. All right. Well, this has been really a very beneficial and helpful Q&A session. I thank you both, Stephen and Mark, uh, for joining us again. Mark Boxer with OFS and Stephen Martin with AFL. And of course, our presenter, Steve Walzak. Thank you so much for putting time into this, um, for preparing a, a very comprehensive and concise information for our our attendees and does anybody have just overall any kind of closing comments i know we addressed some uh specific items but overall a closing comment um would each of you like to state before we wrap it up mark no we just we consider density to be a very important thing moving forward and 200 micron fiber and collapsible ribbons are both you know, tools that we consider to be very important to be able to meet the requirements for service providers in, in really providing the amounts of fiber that are going to be needed for, you know, all of the technologies that are you know, being used today and then also lining up. So we're, we're very excited about um, really all of these that, um, that Steve talked about today in the webinar. Thank you. And then, Stephen, if you have anything to wrap up for us. Yeah, I also uh, I feel the same. I, I believe what we're talking about today will become the norm uh, in the very uh, 
uh, near future. Uh, these higher density products are enabled by technologies like uh, collapsible ribbon and 200 micron fiber. That will become the norm in a few years from now. Uh, this will be what, uh, what everyone expects to see. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Steve, our presenter, uh, final, final like to, words. Okay, I'd like to thank um, Mark and Stephen again. Uh, you were invaluable on the call or on the quite Q&A section and to the construction of the webinar, so thanks for that. I just think it's cool that after 34 years, you know, it, it, it's it's an exciting time to be in fiber. This is, I remember the early coatings, you know, changes in coatings. I remember the early introduction of ribbons and uh, 12 fiber ribbon mechanical splice. You know, about the time you get complacent in this industry and it's mature and you're doing the same thing all the time, then the, the manufacturers and the, and the demands of the market say, just press the manufacturers and these great engineers. So what if we reduce the coating? Uh, what, what if we don't bond the whole ribbon? You, you know, and you, you go, you look at it now, you go, gosh, it's simple. Why don't we think of this before? But it's it's far, far, far from trivial from a manufacturing performance testing uh, standpoint. So it it's just remains an exciting and, and young industry, even for old timers. It, it, it So, you know, stay tuned, uh, get trained on it, you know, research things and, and learn. You, you got to keep learning. And that's what I like about this industry. Absolutely. And um, like uh, all the information that's offered here, like we said, it's going to be available post um, event on our website. You can visit ISEMAG, so ISEMAG.com to review the recording and uh, share the recording with colleagues. Please do so. And for other webinars and podcast series that are coming up, please stay tuned to that website as well. And again, just thank you everyone for taking time to be on this call and our participants for investing as well. You know, your professional education and development, like Steve said, is, is really important in this ever-changing and growing industry. So we are glad to be a part of it. And with that, I'll sign off for all of us and say thank you. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Janice and Michelle. Out.